Thank you so much, Heather and Ivan. And it is so good to be able to be in our seventh e huddle. Uh, we just had a Super Bowl, and uh, we're still praying for the fans of uh, Cincinnati. Uh, and we are uh, praising together. Uh, I don't know if praising is a word, but we're rejoicing together with the San, uh, fans from LA. And we noticed throughout the, the uh, Super Bowl, we noticed the huddle. Uh, as a matter of fact, my dad and my mom, I'm sure they're watching right now, and my dad uh, called me and he said, uh, we're watching the Super Bowl, and now your mom understands what a huddle is. Uh, I show her, you know, and the huddle is when the players get together with their leadership right in the middle of the team, and they plan in order to go for the next play uh, with the objective to win the game. And that is the reason why we have been getting together for the last uh, seven years uh, right here as a North American division with leaders, with pastors. And today we have invited lay leaders as well uh, to be able to, to meet as we're getting ready to run the next play and to win this game for God's honor and God's glory. And that is the reason why it is so good to see so many of you. I see some of my friends. I see Pastor Tony Anobile. I see Pastor Jorge Aguero. I see Pastor Leslie Lewis and Haskell Williams. I see Gregorio and Pastor Jose Pagan. I see Glenn Alternat. My goodness, I see Dan and Darikuma. And I see a Stephanie Willie Ferguson. My goodness, welcome to each and every one of you. And right now, uh, for a few moments, I would like for every one of you to go to the chat. Yeah, I see Craig Carr, our new ministerial director in the Mid-America Union. And I see Pastor James Mangum all the way in Long Island, New York, and Lloyd Schaffenberg. My goodness, it's so good to see so many of you. I want you to go to the chat and just let us know on that chat where you're, where you're uh, watching from. Let us know. Uh, and I know that right here on, the, on Zoom, we have people from North America. But I know that on Facebook and YouTube, we have people from all over the world. So right now, right there in Facebook and in uh, YouTube, please go to, your chat, to the chat and let us know, let us know where you are uh, watching uh, from. I see Richie Harvinson, he's saying, love e Harold. And I see Ron Sidney, he's watching from Detroit. And Lola Moore, hey Lola, watching from Bowie, Maryland. And Richard Floyd McNeil, all the way from Atlanta. Uh, it's so good to be able to see each and every one of you here today. I see my friend Justin Lyons all the way in Minnesota and Eduardo Monteiro all the way in New Jersey. My goodness, so good to see each other. Jimmy Ferguson and Stag Stanley McGinn. All right, very good. So good. So let's get to the reason why we're here. Why are we here? As it has been mentioned, this year is a year of multiply. And for the last seven years, we've done some great work in the huddle together. This is something that belongs to all of us. We came up with a definition for evangelism. There have been years when some of us talking, uh, we have realized that we're not doing our best when it comes to reaching people for Jesus. And that is the reason why we try to get together as a collective mind for North America pastors, administrators, church leaders, uh, lay pastors, volunteer lay pastors, and elders because we said it's going to be hard to do evangelism if we, don't, if we don't know what it is. So together we came up with a definition for evangelism, and I have it right here. I would like to show it to you. Evangelism, our definition of evangelism in North America is to reach, reclaim, and retain the people of North America with Jesus' mission and message of compassion, hope, and wholeness. We're not happy with just reaching. We want to reclaim those who were counted in our numbers before and are no longer with us. And there is a good group of those. And we also want to retain uh, and to keep those whom we have reached. Uh, not only with our message, but also with our actions and with the ministry of Jesus. So that's our definition of evangelism for North America. But together with that, together with that, we've had... And we came up together with six actions of evangelism. And we believe that if these six actions are based in prayer, and we work together as a church and as leaders and as members, we can do some great things for God's honor and God's glory in North America. And the first action of evangelism, I want to put it on the screen right now, is love. Uh, foster multiple connection points that are welcoming and safe. 
Jesus said it. It's written in red in my Bible that they will know that you are my disciples if they see that you have love for others. Uh, even the redeemed, uh, on the day when Jesus comes in his second coming, it says there, for as much, he will say, for as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it unto me. So the distinctive characteristic of a disciple of Jesus is that he or she loves others. The distinctive characteristic of those that are going to be redeemed when Jesus comes is the fact that they did it for the least of this. So as a church, we must begin loving others. And I go to the next one. Uh, we must serve. And that is the second action of evangelism in North America. Serving is loving people in practical ways. And I want to say this one thing. We serve because it is the right thing to do. We do not serve, listen up, we do not serve because we want people to be baptized. But we realize that once we love them and we serve them, they want to hang out with us. Ah, I want to tell you this. Uh, just the other day, uh, our neighbor, his name is Daryl, he's a wonderful man. Him and his wife and one of his kids, they live in the house. Uh, he's now retired. Uh, he has dogs. We have dogs. And, and we've been making friends with Daryl now for, for a long time since we moved in the area. Uh, the other day, <clears throat> Daryl comes out. He realizes that my wife, Joanne, is planting a church in Washington, D.C. We have never invited him to church. And perhaps, you know, my friend Dan Cerns will say, uh, you know, shame on you, Jose. Shame on you. If it was me, I would have given him that glow track by now. I know, Dan. We're trying our best here. So, you know, we've been building that friendship. And the other day, uh, as we're walking around, uh, Daryl says uh, to Joanne, to my wife, uh, where is your church? Because I would like to come to your church. You guys are great people. Uh, I enjoy your fellowship and your company. I want to come to your church. You see, when we love people and we serve them, it makes it a lot easier for them to want to hang out with us and to come to church with us. Number three, our third point is baptize. Our third action of evangelism. Uh, and it is our responsibility to provide multiple opportunities for people to commit to Jesus and to the church. And my dear pastor, my dear colleague, I see my friend Eugene Kidney all the way in Texas, in Dallas, Texas. I, I, I want to say this one thing. Uh, we must love. We must serve. Simply because it is the right thing to do. But there are times when the opportunity to make that appeal arises. We as pastors, we have pulpits and we preach from our pulpits on a regular basis. And I want to say one thing. Please, pastor... In the name of Jesus, do not waste a good sermon. Do not let a great sermon go by without making that appeal. Amen. Ah, you know, uh, God has given you the opportunity to preach awesome sermons, and you spend all week preparing that sermon. Please, in the name of Jesus, don't close that sermon without making some type of appeal and inviting people. It is not okay. And I'm going to say it with a lot of love, but it is not okay to spend 52 weeks of the year Loving people, serving people, preaching to people, and not invite them to join Jesus and the church. Is that okay? Ha! Is that okay? Please do not take this as a rebuke. Take this as an encouragement. As pastors, as church leaders, as church members, it is our duty to issue that invitation. And when people say, I want to be part, I want to accept Jesus, and I want to be part of that church, I want to remind you, we're not bouncers. We are facilitators. Amen. Action number four, equip. I have seen at times when uh, we as a church think that baptism is the end of a journey. And, and, and it is very, very important that we remember this. Baptism is a birth. It's not the graduation. At times I have seen how we baptize people and after that we drop them. And, and we let them be and we do not take care of them. And we start treating them as if they have been in the church for years. And I want to say this. Even people who have been in the church for years need to be treated with love. Amen. But those that have just been baptized, they are babies. We must love them. We must take care of them. They need to learn how to, to eat and they need to learn how to, to, to dress. And at times we need to, to, at times we need to uh, burp them after they eat. And, and, you know, just like babies, they are spiritual babies. We need to make sure that we love our babies and we equip them. And at the same time, I want to say this, a disciple must not be someone that just knows about Jesus, but it must be someone that makes other disciples. Amen. Action number five, 
plant. We realize that when we plant churches, we're able to reach people that we have not been reaching before. Uh, new church plants have new DNAs. And they're able to reach people that existing churches have a hard time reaching. And that is the reason why in North America, we want to see baby churches all over. Uh, about uh, five years ago, we had 5,000 churches and about uh, seven, 800 companies and some groups. Now with churches, companies and groups, we have nearly 7,000 churches because of your faithful work of planting churches all across our territory. And finally, action number six, revitalize. And that is to diagnose and implement growing strategies for plateauing and declining churches. We have grandma churches in North America. Churches that have done really well. Churches that have had babies, but they are getting older. And we want to make sure as we continue to have baby churches that we also, that we also take care of grandma and of those mama churches that are getting a little older right now. There may be times in North America when we need to put one of our churches to rest. And we may need to give one of our churches a proper burial. But we don't want to have to do too much of that. We would love to see churches in North America that are revitalized. And that is, uh, that is our sixth action of evangelism. But quickly, as I close today, I want to go, I want to go uh, to, I want to go to, the main reason why we're here. This year, our emphasis is on baptize. Jesus, as he left, he said, go ye therefore and make disciples. And he explained how to make disciples. He gave us the, he gave us the components to make disciples. And he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So that is one of the components for making disciples is to baptize them. But my friend, friend Glenn Alternat, there is another component to making disciples. And it says there, and teaching them, listen up, and teaching them all of the things that I have taught you. Jesus did not say, and teaching them all of your traditions. He said, and teaching them all of the things that I have taught you. So I want to make it clear today. I have heard people talk about baptism in a derogatory way, and I know it's hard, and at times we, turn, we, we, we have a, a tendency to talk down those things that are hard to do. And I have seen people talk about baptism in, the, in a derogatory way and in the same sentence, uplift discipleship. I want to say one thing. Jesus taught us, and he told us that in order to make disciples, we need to have Baptism, and we need to have teachings. Babies must be born in order to be able to grow. Babies must be born in order to be able to become mature and reproducing disciples that can make other disciples. So uh, in order to make disciples, we need to baptize, and we also need to equip. Amen? So that is my challenge today. We want to see a church in North America that has babies, that baptizes. But we also want to see a church in North America that equips, that, that, that helps those babies to become mature and reproducing disciples that we may be able to multiply. Amen? And last but not least, that Bible verse, the Great Commission, ends with a promise. You know, for years I thought that there would be a time when I would have to stand on my own towards the end of time and, and, and survive on my own. But right there, Jesus, and this is written in red in my Bible and in your Bible, Jesus said, and surely I will be with you till the end. Guess what? It is hard work. Making a disciple in the 21st century is not an easy thing in North America, in the United States and in Canada and in Bermuda and in the islands of Guam and Micronesia. I know I've been there. We have been there together. It's not easy. But you know what's the great thing? That Jesus is with you. Ah, you're not alone. You don't have to do this alone, Halsey, Pete, in, in Ontario. You don't have to do it alone, Noel Ojeda, in, in Indiana. You don't have to do this alone, Pastor James Mangon in Long Island. Vic Arriola, you don't have to do this alone in the Pacific Union. You know, he is with you. He has promised. So as we go out to baptize and make disciples, 
let's not forget, he, Jesus, is with us. Amen and amen. Amen.